All right, so thank you for this opportunity to talk to you. Um, what I wanna discuss is how DDS, the data distribution service enables um, secure uh, full stack end-to-end -end real time communication for cloud native uh, software development. So, um, you know, we've been doing this uh, for years um, and now I think we are evolving towards a way where we wanna standardize on the way this is done. Um, and one of the things that we saw mentioned through the talks um, was this notion of compute and communication and how they sort of, um, you know, dance together. And you gotta solve both problems as we go forward. And so what I'm gonna focus on um, today is the communication aspect of this cloud native software development, how that dances together with the compute aspect that we have been looking to get uh, at it, um, you know, together with, uh, with all the presentations so far. Now, some of the presentations earlier um, have touched upon this. I particularly want to focus on uh, this DDS standard. And I'm going to give you a very high level bird's eye view of DDS and what that is. Um, it's been around since 2004. It's, uh, it's used in many different industries outside of automotive as well. And it's uh, gaining momentum in automotive. Then I want to talk about how DDS naturally supports cloud native software development um, and uh, and then uh, I want to suggest an idea of how we can leverage it uh, for plug and play SOFI microservices. Um, so let me start with, um, you know, a high level picture of, you know, most people know the OSI st uh, stack. This is a picture from the industrial IoT consortium IIC uh, connectivity framework. Um, uh, it's available, I have the link up there. Um, it's a free download. Um, and this is essentially a refined version of the OSI stack that shows um, the different layers of communication between two participants, you know, participant X and Y, that's what you see here in this picture. You know, when two components, two software components, uh, you know, two entities, uh, two parties are communicating, you know, X and Y, what are the different things that need to happen? So you can see from the bottom up, you've got the physical layer with the bits being exchanged, we've got the link layer with frames and the networking layer, which is the IP layer. So let me just pause there for a moment. So the networking is really what I think most people assume. This is what our network interface gives us. This is the TCP IP stack. You could be running UDP, you could be running uh, IP. Um, you can also abstract that network networking as you see in container to container networking. So really think of networking as an exact, uh, abstraction for exchanging um, blobs of data, right? And this, when I say a blob, I mean essentially something opaque. It's a, it's a, it's a, you know, a vector of bytes essentially. And what that content is is completely opaque to the underlying network infrastructure, whether it's uh, real hardware, whether it's virtualized, uh, however you think want to think about it, right? And there is a standardized interface for that. Then we kind of all assume that. Um, but then what happens at the layers above that? Right, so then you know the the layers above that, you know the transport and the framework layers are really uh, the transport layer is really that layer about you know sharing opaque blobs, and and it really gives us what we need um, really uh, technical interoperability, right? But that's not sufficient when we start to build uh, systems and uh, you know where components need to interoperate and need to understand what the other component is sharing. So you need structured data. And so that next layer is the framework layer, and that is about uh, syntactic interoperability. It's about sharing structured data where the data itself is discoverable. Um, uh, it's unambiguously uh, interpreted, parsed, and um, uh, you, you, you know, if I send a structure, just like you would see in a programming language, you are receiving that structure and you are interpreting it the, the, the same way. And, and, the, and the next layer is the semantic interoperability, which is really about understanding the meaning of the content of that data in an unambiguous way. And that's typically uh, domain specific and it depends on the context of the applications or the context of the, of the systems. Um, so you see these different layers defined and where DDS fits in is really, um, really it's a framework layer. It provides a standard for syntactic interoperability and maybe a way to think about it is when we start to build autonomous systems and applications, um, you know, this is sort of the minimum requirement um, for doing autonomy because you need to be able to exchange structured data in a systematic way, right? So just 
just having a big blob isn't enough. Uh, that's okay for humans, but that's really not okay for when we have autonomous actors participating in the system. Okay, so uh, uh, now what? We're, so DDS is essentially the framework layer, and if you look at the IICF, it kind of defines all the details of you know what to expect from a framework layer and so on. It has a number of functions and so on defined now. EDS um, is a standard for a framework layer, and it's really uh, a connectivity standard that's been around for uh, since 2004, um, and it's been growing steadily. Um, it's maintained by a standards organization called the Object Management Group, same folks who also maintain UML, which most people are familiar with, um, uh, and they also host a number of different consortia. Uh, DDS is uh, also an open uh, and cross vendor supported uh, technology. So there are, I know there are like three, uh, at least three, maybe more open source implementation. There are many commercial implementations available. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's quite well established at this point. And at a, uh, if you want to know more, you can have the link there at the DDS Foundation and, and you, can, you can learn more about it. Now, really, I want to highlight two aspects of DDS. One is, uh, the interoperability layer, the RTPS, DDSI RTPS uh, protocol, which is really a public subscribe protocol for um, sharing uh, structured data. And it gives you interoperability between implementation in the same way that you, know, you can run a TCP IP stack and they may be different stacks, but, but they work, right? And you can communicate between machines running on, uh, you know, and applications running on different machines uh, written by different people. There's the same idea behind the DDSI RTPS protocol, except it's for structured data. So you can use multiple DDS implementations, they interoperate. The second idea, the second big idea is the API, right? So that, that is what you see here in the top. And th this API is, is essentially a way of having a portable abstraction to which applications can write. And this portable abstraction is defined in a way that it's um, available in multiple languages um, such that uh, you know, you can write in C, C++, Java, uh, whatever, uh, you know, you choose C Sharp, Python, and, and so on. So there are many language bindings available, uh, but it's the same abstraction. Um, now, DDS usage in automotive has been growing steadily. Autosar has offered the DDS communication binding since 2018, uh, March release. Um, and it's defining essentially a binding uh, to the DDS APIs. Um, Autostar Classic, uh, there's now work going on to add DDS to Autostar Classic so that there is a full Autostar ecosystem that can leverage and benefit from DDS capabilities. Its usage has been expanding. Uh, it's been used for a long time. It, uh, DDS actually grew up in the robotics world. That's where its origins are. And then uh, it's not a surprise it's been adopted by ROS. So ROS2 is a rewrite using DDS as a communication middleware. And it continues to grow as we saw in some of the earlier presentations as well uh, with the AutoVare, which is using ROS, uh, which is using DDS underneath. Uh, now, a lot of the systems also use DDS APIs directly. They're, you can uh, wrap them, of course, uh, but you can also use them directly. And when you do that, you have full access to all the capabilities of DDS with, with minimal overhead. Um, so when you do that, you want to build your own um, uh, IO model essentially to define the data inputs and outputs, the interfaces that you're going to use to um, connect your software components. So what are the capabilities that DDS provides? Uh, a number of different things. So these are all sort of different DDS specifications. Uh, you should think of DDS as a family of specifications where you know, the RTPS spec is kind of defining the wire protocol, the, there's API specs, there's the specs for managing QSs, um, uh, you know, which is part of the DDS DCPS spec. Then there's a security specification which shows how to put security um, in a very fine grained way um, uh, for different data flows in DDS. There's the specs that's defining how to define your structured data itself in a platform independent way, that's uh, it, uh, IDL. And then the exercise which tells you how to serialize and deserialize it and um, how to represent it. Um, uh, so there's different aspects of uh, data management uh, covered here. There's an RPC spec that lets you define um, procedure uh, RPC type of remote procedure calls. Uh, there's also a spec that gives you a RESTful interface to a DDS uh, data space. So you can use just HTTP APIs to 
output data and retrieve data, uh, and you can build front ends and so on. There's also uh, specs that um, profile DDS for very resource constrained environments. And then on the manufacturing side, not on the vehicle itself, but how you build vehicles, there's OPC UA, which is a technology used in smart factories and so on. And, and so there's uh, that integrate DDS with, with the OPC UA as well. Right now, the way this picture is drawn, you see that the transports are um, uh, outside of DDS. And this, uh, this, the specs are designed in such a way that they can run over shared memory. There's implementations available that do zero copy uh, shared memory. Uh, there's a TSN spec in progress, um, and there's been a lot of industry demonstrations and uh, con uh, proof of concepts uh, showing DDS, TSN, and how they marry together. Of course, out of the box, DDS applications will run using UDP or shared memory, depending on where your components are located. And then there's CCP bindings also um, available so that you can run over TCP. So uh, the idea behind DDS conceptually in terms of capabilities, you're writing data objects into a data space and you're reading updates from that data space. And you don't really uh, care who wrote the update you got and you don't really care who's going to read your whatever update you write. So you're decoupling writers from readers or you can say publishers from subscribers. And then you use quality of service to configure the flow. And this gives you essentially a way of sort of just like databases, uh, you know, do for uh, applications and the rest, a way of managing real-time data um, uh, in a decoupled way, and you can build new components and applications. So when it comes to the stack itself, um, this is what it looks like. Your application code is essentially linking to a DDS library. This library would have the right API bindings, and then it's managing all the QS policies, and it's abstracting you from essentially the lower level details of the network stack and so on. So this picture kind of shows you why this is a natural fit for cloud native. Uh, discovery is automatic in DDS and QS is automatically used to manage the data flows. So what happens here is uh, um, that uh, this picture is kind of notionally showing, um, you know, the data bus in the middle, and then you are seeing that you can have application components or software components uh, your services written in different languages, potentially running on different platforms, but the developer has the same abstraction um, that they're working with um, and it's very portable. And you can configure what network bindings you're going to use, what transports you're going to use uh, just through configuration files. Um, and so you don't necessarily have to hard code that in the application. And then you can use a mix and match. Uh, you can go over LAN, you can go over VAN, and then if you're on the same host, you can go over shared memory, including zero memory, uh, zero copy shared memory. So it's very flexible. So how it fits into SOFI and how it fits into microservices, um, this is the idea here, right? Your application is running in a container. You've got the container runtime and your data bus essentially is decoupling um, the applications from the compute platform, the hardware, and also from where they are running, where they're running on the cloud, whether they're running locally, um, so you can sort of uh, think of this as essentially an elastic data bus that stretches to wherever your components are. And as long as they are configured correctly, the application code does not have to change and the right data starts flowing to the right place at the right time. And the Y protocol essentially takes care of the interoperability and it's completely decentralized. There's no, uh, no brokers in the system. It's all peer to peer. So things just sort of magically works, all right? So you could run all these components on the embedded edge. Um, and that's fine. Uh, you could decide that you are going to test everything in the cloud. And we saw a lot of presentations already around that idea of this parity. So you get that. And then you can do a mix and match, right? So this is very useful as you incrementally sort of test and do simulate, you know, maybe simulate some things, maybe run something on the edge. So you've got this notion of you can draw these dotted lines and you can change the deployment. It's a very flexible way of doing deployment, but you do need this data bus that sort of gives you this data connectively. So Really where I wanted to wrap things up was with kind of this idea or a proposal to suggest that maybe, um, you know, if we start to think of DDS as this, this common sort of, uh, you know, just like TCP IP gives us a common networking layer, we also recognize that that's not enough um, because that's too low level. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's good for web applications uh, because, you know, but then you still have HTTP, but, you know, uh, humans, uh, you know, or, or, or uh, you know, uh, the semantics is, is kind of tied to the applications, right? 
Here again, you have structured data, but it's meant for real time, uh, high performance, uh, you know, deterministic uh, communications, because that's the use cases for DDS. And so, you know, putting that essentially as part of the specs um, and as part of the container runtime gives us kind of a layer that gives us structured data communication uh, that can be configured for really running anything anywhere. And then um, you have the ability to run applications that use the DDS APIs directly. You have the ability to run ROS. Uh, ROS already supports a way of switching different to different implementations. So whatever implementation you happen to configure your Sophie runtime with, you can use that one. And then, um, you know, and so therefore all of the autoware AD kit would be, uh, would work there, for example, you could be running auto side applications and you could be running also cloud native applications that you're writing uh, new things that you may come up with. So this is really, uh, really the idea that uh, I wanted to suggest. And I think that's about it in terms of what I wanted to cover. I think I maybe went a bit too fast. But no, thank thank you, Rajiv. No, that, that was that was perfect. Um, and, and yeah, I think this is a good discussion. You, you guys are members of Sophie. Get get involved with the, uh, the different working groups to, to look at that, especially the cloud native uh, dev working group. So, yeah, awesome.